Hello, in this presentation we're going to be talking about using water distribution system models. Water distribution models are indeed just a way to solve hydraulic equations. They can't really be viewed as just a single tool because really they can be used to solve a wide variety of problems. So a distribution system model should be thought of more as a toolbox, not really just a single tool because they can be used to solve many different problems. And we're going to go through them now just to give you an overview of some of the kinds of problems that can be solved. In later lectures, we'll be giving more details on exactly how to use them. So what kind of problems are water distribution models used for? Well, as you see here, there's just a whole variety of analyses you can do. They're basically steady state or EPS models, but what's really going on is what kind of problems do they solve? Okay, so we could have a steady state run or an EPS run. What would you use them for? And some of the things are ranging from fire flow analysis to picking out pumps to energy costing, water quality analysis, mixing in tanks, tank sizing, looking for which valves are critical in the system, planning flushing programs, just a whole lot more things that you can do. Basically, they can behave like your real water distribution system, but you can do things and ask what if questions that you really can't answer in the real system. The most basic run is a steady state run where you essentially provide the boundary conditions, what pumps are running, what the tank water levels are, and the model fills in all the pressures, flows, velocities, and other properties of the hydraulics of the water distribution system. So they give you essentially the ability to see what's going on inside of pipes and then ask these what if questions. So not only can it simulate what's in the ground right now, but what happens if you change things, if you add pipes, change the way you operate the system. And this is used in design, for example, to say what if we change the design? What if we put in a bigger pipe or a smaller pipe or a different pump? And also, what happens if we change the operations of the system? What if we change the rules by which we turn pumps on or off or the settings of valves? So there's a lot of different kinds of things you can do with the distribution system models. The most basic of those is pipe sizing. This is a fundamental reason that these distribution models were developed in the beginning, was to figure out how big pipes should be. And this gives you a little overview of the pipe sizing problems, which we'll go over in other lectures as well. But essentially, you start off with the model of your distribution system. You lay out the piping that you're proposing to use and make your initial selection of sizes. You pick some reasonable sizes that you think are going to work. And then you run the model. In addition to running the model for the system as you expect to install it, also you'd be playing around with the uncertainty and demand estimates, the potential for outages of individual components to make sure that the system works even if you're a little off in your demands or if there are some kind of outages in the system, whether it's a power outage at a pump station or a pipe failure. And then you go through and compare those model run results with the guidelines. Usually it's something like must provide at least 20 PSI distribution system or one bar of pressure depending on the units that are used. If it works, then you say, okay, hydraulically this system will work and it's what we want. And then you would get into costing to figure out, well, is this the least expensive or a reasonably priced one? Not necessarily looking for the least expensive one. What you want is something that's robust at a reasonable price. If it shows that it doesn't work well, then you go through and reformulate the design. Maybe increase the size of pipes or decrease it or add another tank and continue making the runs until you get up with something that is believable and something that you like the way it looks. And then you can present this up the line to the decision makers who are not be modelers, but they may be the chief of engineering or the manager or the utility or whoever has to approve capital purchases. So that's basically an overview, a high level overview of the use of modeling and pipe sizing. There's a lot of other uses. For example, setting up pressure zones. This is the most fundamental problem really in water system design is where do you put the pressure zone boundaries? What are the extents of the pressure zones? What hydraulic grade line is going to be maintained in each zone? You locate where the boundary valves are or boundary pump stations and then you can decide on the location of those valves and pumps and what settings you have for the PRVs as you see in the picture here or the pumps between the pressure zones. Fire flow analysis is one of the most widely used tools in water distribution system modeling. And it basically asks the question of can the water distribution system deliver the flows that are needed for firefighting? And these vary from different parts of the world. So some have very high ones in North America and lower ones generally in other parts of the world. 
what you can do are two ways to approach this. You can set what flow you want and see do you have enough pressure at the end of the system, or you can set the pressure that you want and the model will calculate what flow can be delivered at that residual pressure. And the good thing about the modeling tools you have in Water Gems and WaterCAD are they can solve for this all over the system because you don't just want to solve for what's the fire flow at one point. You want to know where in the system can I meet the needed fire flows. And the Water Gems fire flow analysis basically will take any part of the system that you want and go through node by node and figure out how much water can be delivered at every point in the distribution system in one run rather than having to make hundreds of runs of the hydraulic model. Also, you want to look at what happens when pipes break and the system has to be shut down. This is what's called criticality analysis or reliability analysis, where you're failing elements in the system hydraulically in the model rather than out in the real world, because you don't want to be shutting off pump stations or closing off pipes just to see what's going to happen. You'd rather do this in a simulation model. And then see what is the effect on the distribution system when you do this shutdown customers are going to be put out of water or have their pressure adversely affected. They may decide to put in more piping or maybe better valving to isolate problems to a smaller area. Valves are very important when it comes to criticality. I mean, a single pipe break can be a very minor nuisance that affects a couple of customers on a given street, or it can knock out the entire distribution system depending on where the valves are located in the system. Now most of those runs would be done in steady state runs, but extended period analysis also gives you a lot of extra information in that it follows the performance of the distribution system over time. It has a lot of uses in understanding operations because operations of water systems are not static. They are things that continuously change over time and extended period simulation models are very important when you're understanding what's going on in terms of distribution system operation. Very important for tank sizing. Do you have enough volume of water in the tank? And they're also very important for understanding control settings, at what levels of tanks or what other conditions would cause you to turn pumps on or off or change the status of valves. Energy analysis is another important use of water distribution system modeling. What the models do is calculate the amount of energy used and the cost of that energy. And there's some surprises usually when you do this. You can identify places where you're not really pumping very efficiently or you can identify where you're doing a very good job. In those places where you're not pumping very efficiently, the model can show you what pumps ought to be replaced or how your pump operation should be modified. And usually you'll find in some places in every distribution system there are places where you're not really running your system the most efficiently. And there's a lot of payback in running the model, finding these places where the system is not running very efficiently and modify the operations or modify the pumping equipment to make the system operate very efficiently. Water quality analyses are another kind of run of a water distribution system model. In this case, you're tracking the water quality through the distribution system. So it's not just measuring pressures and flows or, or estimating pressures and flows, but you're trying to now calculate what are the water quality aspects of the distribution system. And there are really three different kinds of water quality runs that can be done in water gems. First and the most simple is age, just how old is the water. And a lot of times, this is uh, about all you need. You basically are using this to figure out where are we likely to have old water in terms of chlorine residual or disinfectant byproduct formation. And age is a good indicator of that. The places where you have the oldest water are places where you're going to have very likely the most serious water quality issues. Also, you can go back through and trace the source of water. This is especially important in systems that have multiple sources, and you want to know which users get water from which sources. And a lot of times, this is pretty surprising. If you look at a distribution system, you look at where sources are located, if you have a multi-source system, you would think that the water from this source gets to these users, and the water from this source gets to these users. And it turns out that when pumps cycle on and off, and you have this kind of intermittent operation, that the water really sloshes around the system a lot more than we would think that it does. And of course, the final kind of analysis for water quality is actually tracking constituents through the system. These can be conservative constituents that don't break down or react, or they can be things like disinfectant residual that is involved in reactions as it moves through distribution system. Another type of analysis is transient analysis. In this kind of analysis, you're solving a whole different set of equations because what you're looking at here is 
fact that whenever momentum of the water changes in the pipes, pressure waves are created. This goes back to Newton's second law, F equals ma. When you change the momentum, you've got to exert a force. And when that happens, you create waves. And these waves move through the system. And they can do a lot of damage, really two different ways. One is the high pressures from these transients can break pipes. You can have some very high pressure waves that can go wandering through a distribution system and breaking pipes as you see the picture here. Also, they can lead to very low pressures in the water distribution system, such that they can be even negative. And if you have any kind of cracks or breaks in the pipes, they can lead to intrusion of water from outside distribution system into the water distribution piping network. So there's a lot of things you can do with transient analysis. In this case, you would be using the hammer program as opposed to water gems, because the hammer program solves these different set of equations that, that relate to transient analysis. Now, in other talks coming up, we'll be going through the details of each of these types of runs. Done in this one is just giving you basically the overview of what kind of analyses can be run.